Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. Today we're going to do a maintenance checkup on the tape deck of an Amstrad CPC 464. We're going to try to get it working, we'll tune it, and then we'll restore any missing or broken pieces. So you may remember this Amstrad CPC 464 from a previous episode. It's the one that Patreon supporter Leo Albanese sent me in the hopes of restoring it and leaving it as good as new. Last time we got it working and we cleaned it up on the outside, and today it's time for the tape deck. Tape decks and other devices with moving parts tend to be much more likely to break over time and develop faults, so I wouldn't be surprised if at least initially it's not working correctly. The tape section comes together with the volume control and the switch for the whole computer. The switch often fails after many years, just uh, grime accumulates inside and actually stops making contact. So. This one might work, but we might as well clean it up. And then the volume wheel, it's also good to do a little maintenance on it to make sure that it uh, makes good contact. So for the switch, we need to remove these two screws that hold this plate in place. Ah, they get caught by the magnet of the loudspeaker. And now we need to bend those tabs up a little bit. Like that, just open them up. And there you go. And there you can see the grime building up already. So let's clean it with some alcohol. Yeah, what a difference. <laughs> See how dark this turned out. And we might as well do that as well. So yeah, the, the way it works is that there are two metal pieces there. And this just rotates this way. So the switch is like this in one position and it's not touching both of them. And in the other one is touching both of them. It's super simple. Like that is not touching, and like that it's touching. And now we just put it back the same way. We removed it and snapped the tabs back in place. Perfect. And if we really want to check, we can just do a continuity test. So you can see it visually. When the switch is away from those two, there should be no, con no contact in there. Yep, we're good. And now there should definitely be contact. Perfect. For the volume wheel, I'm not going to disassemble it completely. So we can remove this. This is pretty clean. And the contact happens inside there, so I don't want to go as far as desolder in it. You could, and then clean it. I'm just going to apply some contact cleaner like this. And then shake it. Rotate it a bunch, just to get it really clean. And that's usually all it needs. You'll know if you need to do this, because the, the sound will sound kind of crackly and, and noisy. Um, and if you touch the volume wheel, it, it will often stop and then start again. So that's a sign that this needs to be cleaned up. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay is my go-to solution to make any PCBs for my own projects. They're also currently running a PCB design tutorial contest where you can submit your own videos or articles about PCB design for the chance to win some nice prizes. I actually want to learn more about PCB design, so I won't be participating, but I'm very interested in checking out the entries whenever they're published. So for more information, head on over to PCBWay.com. And now on to the tape deck itself. So here, the most important thing is to check out the rubber belt. This one looks to be in pretty good condition. I mean, sometimes you can see that you start moving this by hand and this starts slipping. So you know right away that that's not gonna work. Or sometimes as you rotate it, you'll see a, a wavy curve. 
that means that it kind of dried in place and, and it got some curve in it. But this one looks really good. I think I was told that the, this particular cassette deck is not working, but so far it looks pretty good. Certainly this seems good enough. If it doesn't work, it's probably something else. Maybe something that they didn't hear. Oh, I hadn't noticed this before. Look at this. So clearly somebody was here. Well, we know that from the how the case had that uh, weird connector, but uh, they certainly were in this area because there's a twist in here, which is not strictly necessary. There's um, there's some wires to hold the cables in place, but okay, whatever. And yeah, there's definitely looks to be some corrosion there, but nothing really horrible. Oh, you know what? I said in an earlier video that I didn't think they had done any audio mod, but look at this. That is, I think that's definitely one of the points where people would do that audio mod and that doesn't, definitely looks like there's been some soldering going on in there. So yeah, I take it back. They probably did some stuff here and if the tape deck is not working, <laughs> it could be because of that. So we'll, we'll see. But yeah, anyway, this is, the belt looks good enough that I'm not going to replace it right away just for the sake of replacing it. As far as the rest of the tape, the things to check are the pause button. Oh, yeah, this happens a lot. So the pause button has a mechanism back here that it's completely missing. There's supposed to be um, a plastic with a little spring and a cap. And it's a fairly complicated plastic piece that you know, makes it that the first time you push it in, it snaps into place. And the second time it actually lets go. That is also unfortunately pretty common for it to pop. So fortunately, that's not very important. Um, not, you don't often have to do pause for anything. The rest of the buttons seem to be working okay. So one of the other things that is very important to check out for is this rubber, it's not a belt, it's this rubber ring around this wheel. So that, the purpose of that is to make contact with this wheel and transfer the movement. So when you press play, and now I move the motor, you see how it's transferring the movement from this wheel onto this one. That one, it's very common for it to dry crack and sometimes just split open. And when that happens, the tape will move maybe just for like half a revolution and then stop. And if you don't stop it, then this keeps moving, but not this. So you'll spool the tape out and potentially break things. So um, that's something to watch out for. But that one looks great. I don't think we have to replace anything with that either. So, so far this has been in really good condition. And so yeah, all these buttons work. The, there's another rubber belt in here that's just to move the, the numbers and those work fine. And then what we're missing here is the reset button. So we'll look into adding that at the very end. The head itself, the reading head, it's important that it's clean. It looks really clean, but I'm gonna give it a swipe with um, alcohol as usual, just to give you that extra little thing. This is for recording. So I think there's actually an erase head you know, to be honest, probably nobody's going to be recording anything. Um, so I don't usually test that all that much, to be totally honest. So um, this is the really important one. So after that initial checkup, we should go ahead and test the tape deck to see if it's working. The best way to test the tape deck is not to put it back in the case. That's because it goes in the upper side of the case and it's a pain to put it there and you need to flip it over and screw it. So but we still need the top of the case so the keyboard is connected. So I'm gonna leave the top case connected just for that. And then we're going to place the tape deck right here. Now you need to be careful about a couple of things. You don't want the pulley and the wheels to be touching anything. So you need to put it in a way that those things are not blocked. And then obviously we don't need this anymore. We can plug the real thing and use the actual switch that comes with it. So we'll be able to test that too. Obviously this doesn't need to be connected right now, but you want to make sure that it's not shorting anything. To test that a tape deck is working correctly, I normally start with some 
easy to load tape. In this case, Omami uses just the standard tape loading system. So it's pretty slow speed and it's broken into blocks. This is as easy as it's going to get to load something. And the other advantage is that this is a very inexpensive game. So if something goes horribly wrong with the tape deck and it destroys the tape, it's no big loss. I probably have 10 other Omamis somewhere <laughs> stored. So now we'll also see if the switch works correctly. Yeah, perfect. Okay, let me use the magic keystroke. That's control enter. So both wheels are moving, so that's really good. If not, you need to stop it right away. Okay, I'm hearing a sound. Let's see if it picks it up. There we go. So that's looking good. Okay, that's great. Okay, this is normal part of the loading process. It's using this time to draw some stuff in the screen and then it will continue automatically. There we go. Okay, let's live here a few minutes and see if it loads the game correctly. Ah, yes, that music. <laughs> but the good news is that it loaded correctly, so that's fantastic. Okay, so let's try something a little bit more challenging. This is one of those turbo loading tapes that goes at a higher speed. So if it loads this, I usually call it good and figure that it's going to load anything. So I started out very similar to the other game. This is still using the standard firmware routines. And I think this next one, this next block, is also going to be standard. That was probably just the basic program clearing the screen and writing that text. Yeah, this sounds very much standard. So now we just finished loading the custom loading routines. And this should be faster speed now. Yeah, there you go. So. You can see not just the colors in the in the borders, which are a side effect of that, of the way it's loading things, but you actually hear the pitch that is higher than before. That's because the data is being transferred faster. So one thing to watch out for is that this particular loading routine has no error correction, as far as I know. So if things don't load correctly, what's going to happen is that it's just going to crash at some point, or I think it's trying to load a screen right now, it would load the screen, but it would look garbled. So that's something to watch out for. Well, the screen looks great. So I think this is looking good. Great, that loaded correctly. Let's just make sure. Yep. Awesome, so it looks like the tape is working great. There's another program that I'll use to check that the tape deck is correctly set up. And that's for the fine adjustment of the azimuth. The azimuth is something you can adjust by moving this screw in or out, and that will change how far up the reed head is, and thus centering that head correctly on the track. That's somewhat possible for it to get misaligned over time, and especially if you replace it, you totally need to do that. And if it's not correctly centered, some things will load, but they will not load. All of them will not load correctly. Some things will, some things don't. So this program, it's something that I recorded myself in here, and it checks that the azimuth is correct. I believe it's correct given that it loaded those other two tapes, but let's give it a try so you can see what it's like. The program is really short and it loads pretty quickly. And there you go. So this shows like a histogram. And the ideal is that when you're reading data from the tape, it should be maximized around the peak of this curve. And that's exactly where it is right now. This is perfect. If the azimuth wasn't correct, we'll be seeing 
more data to the side, sometimes scattered. And if it's scattered, then it might mean that it's not just the alignment of the head, but maybe it's the data that the head is reading. But here it looked great. This is now all scattered. This is just noise because there's no data saved in this part. I really should add that segment repeated over and over to test it for longer. But that showed us that this is aligned perfectly. So it's time to put this back in the case. But before we do that, I want to try to replace the broken counter reset button. So this just snaps off. And the way the reset button works is that when it presses this bar in here, see, it moves it there and it resets it to zero. So that's what we're trying to achieve. That's why it's shaped like that. So when you push down, it pushes that little bar back. In the past, I've tried gluing this back together. I've tried even doing some weird things with like melting a tiny little bit of um, metal and sticking it there. Like there's nothing I can do to put this back in place and be sturdy enough. It just breaks right away. There's just so much pressure in that joint. So I actually had some of them 3D printed and I've never had the chance to try them until now. You can see they have that shape. So I believe this needs to be cut. So let's see if this works and if it manages to not break after a few uses. Okay, let's just cut that little extra and let's see if that's enough. So normally that would fit right there. Yeah, like that. Ooh. That's uh, that's encouraging. Okay, so this plastic casing goes like that. Ooh, check it out. We may have a solution here. Yeah, that's great. Okay, let's put it back in the case. So now that I think about it, I think I have some spare parts for the POS key that is not working on my spares box for the Amstrad. Yeah, there we go. That's the one, plus two more pieces. Um, there's this spring. I'm not 100% sure that's one of the pieces. Actually, yeah, I think it is. Well, it looks really tall. No, it's probably not. So there's supposed to be a little spring and a cap that sits on top of this. So. Let's see if we can actually restore the POS key with the help of this. So the idea is that this piece fits right on that black part. And then the underside, this metal piece goes on the underside. So depending when you press pause one way, it goes one way and it latches there. And then the second time you press pause, it goes up and I think it comes down the other way and it lets the POS key release back all the way. So. This is the key part. And then we just need something that holds it in place. Yeah, I mean, like right now it's working just with me holding that in place. Normally there is a spring there and then a piece that fits on top and it hooks inside of the black tube in there. The top piece I'm not too concerned about. We can make a new one and no, I'm not talking about 3D printing anything. We're just going to do it the old fashioned way. This spring is just there to make sure that piece is pushing against this, but it doesn't need much strength. And I really think that this is too long trying to squish this down. I don't know. I'm just not convinced that this is the right piece for it. Maybe it is. We can try like this. If it doesn't work, we can cut it down a little bit and um, that might make it easier to fit in there. So for now, let's manufacture a piece that will go there to st stop everything from flying away. So this is what we're going to use. This is the lead for a resistor or something. Uh, not a very thick one because it's important that it fits in that little tube. And the first thing we need to do is on one end fashion kind of like a fishing hook. So it goes in and then it can't come out anymore. So for that, I just fold it on itself like that and push it in all the way because this needs to go in through the tubey part like that. And then on the other end, we need to make 
sort of like a T, enough of a T to prevent the spring from flying out. So that's what's going to be holding the spring in place. It doesn't have to be fancy or anything, just fold the one way, something like that. Now, maybe I didn't measure this, so maybe this is too long. And if so, we can shorten it a little bit just by folding it a little bit more, but let's give that a try. This is the dangerous part where I do this, it doesn't attach correctly, and then the pieces go flying and I lose them forever. There you go, that's perfect. You hear it? And that shouldn't fall when we do that. There we go, perfect. And also very important, this shouldn't touch this wheel, obviously. It's close, but it's not touching it and I don't think it's going anywhere. And now in everything goes, when you do this, watch out for the reset button. I've done this before, it's easy to snap it if you don't uh, put it in the right place or if you force it a little bit. Another tip related to this is to actually first put this screw here. There's two reasons for that. First, because that's the screw that is going to be holding the reset button in place. Otherwise, if you accidentally move this a little bit and put some of the other screws, the reset button may be rubbing against the side and it might get pushed in. So that won't that will let you fix it in where the place where it moves in and out. The other reason I'm suggesting this first is because there's the speakers right here. And if you happen to drop the screw, it's going to get stuck to the speaker and you pretty much need to remove it out completely everything in order to get it back. So I'd rather do that with the first screw and now with the last one. <laughs> speaking, from, speaking from experience here. So I'm gonna make sure that the button can be pressed. Yep, and I'm gonna tighten it a little bit more. Now I can more safely put the rest of them. I will actually even start with the volume wheel and the power switch. You also need to remember these cables that connect, for example, ground from here to here and you know, some of those annoying little things. This is actually important to keep the cables out of the motor's way. You don't want them getting not so much tangled there, but you don't want any friction because then that would affect how the tape loads. And I totally forgot that this needs to go in before the keyboard. So I need to momentarily remove the keyboard, put this in place, and then the keyboard back in place. And at the same time, it will be more comfortable to hook up ground anyway. There we go. Yep. There you go. Perfect. When Leo bought this computer and had it sent to me, it came with several games, uh, mostly like original AmSoft games that they were given away with the Amstrad at the time. So as the final test, let's just pick one of them and uh, let's try, see if it loads out. It could be that the tapes are very often not working after such a long time, but um, we can try anyway. So actually I'm gonna try Roland in the cave. That was a really early program that I remember playing back in the day. So it was not particularly good, but uh, it definitely was interesting. Let's see if we can load it. Let's turn it on. Okay. The sound is good too. Yeah. And let's see if this loads. So one thing with really old tapes, it's not a bad idea to move them all the way one way and maybe all the way the other way to sort of loosen them up a little bit. If they haven't been played in a long time, they could be stuck. Actually, I could just even try reading off side two. They often have the same program in both sides. Let's try that. So here it is, the secret keystroke. And let's see, I'll set this to zero. Yeah, that works great. Oh, let's look at the pause. Yeah, check it out. Stops perfectly. And now let's see if it loads. Okay, that's very encouraging. Let's leave it there and wait for it to load.
All right. Whoa, that's loud. So yeah, that took a good five minutes, but it loaded correctly. So that's great. Yeah, so in this game, all you can do is jump. And the longer you hold it, the more you jump. Oh, I'm doing the wrong one. So as you can see, it's pretty difficult. <laughs> and you have to get all the way out of the cave. So we got the tape deck working pretty much like new, which is great. However, Leo isn't going to have access to many, if any, Amstrad tapes over in the US. So we're going to come back to this Amstrad and implement the audio in mod. That way he'll be able to use a TZX Duino or a computer or a smartphone to load software other than just using physical tapes. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.